start with a new chapter, please, and the data class. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam, wa ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, amma ba'ad. Tonight on the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal, in the year 1444, corresponding to the 12th of October 2022, we are in our 103rd lesson of Al-Wajid, the concise presentation of the fiqh. On page 633, starting the new chapter, chapter 15, Judicial Proceedings. The legality. Judicial proceedings are sanctioned by the Quran, Sunnah, and consensus of the Muslim nation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it in the Quran, وَأَنِحْكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ So judge you, O Muhammad, between them by what Allah has revealed. Allah also says, يَا دَاوُودُ وَإِنَّا جَعَلْنَاكَ خَلِيفَةً فِي الْأَرْضِ فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِالْحَقِّ O Dawood, verily we have placed you as a successor on the earth. So judge you between men in truth and justice. Well done. The judgment. Kitab al qaba And the judgment is, he says, the, the legalization of it. You could find it in the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Ijma. Now he just came to the Quranic proofs. He mentioned you two verses. He's got plenty of ayat. Which is it's got the hakam hakamu min ahlihi wa hakamu min ahliya. Uh, so Allah he mentioned the judgment regarding, for example, a person who had done a violation in his the state of ihram where he had hunted an animal which has no equivalence. So it will refer to a judge to judge how much penalty he will be paying, as in what is type of animal he needs to slaughter. So if he hunted while he's in a state of haram, a gazelle or a deer, is he going to be, for example, having to slaughter a jazat, which we call it a recompense, a sheep? So it will be a judge. Also, if there is any dispute between the husband and the wife, there will be a judge or an arbitrator from his side, an arbitrator from her side, his side and her side. And also here, yeah, the judgment also is being mentioned about Dawood, alayhi salam, Dawood alayhi salam, he had he was a judge in between the disputes of the people at this time. Also, Sulaiman alayhi salam, he had actually asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that his judgment to synchronize with the judgment of the Almighty. Rabbi Habli Hukman Layam Bagiri Ahadim bin Badi. O Lord, give me and grant me judgment which is not going to be, or a, a rule over the world which is not going to be uh, uh, given to anybody be after me. And Sulaiman alayhi salam's story when he had judged regarding the two sisters who had claimed that the baby is to one of them. So the elder, she said, it's mine. The youngest said, it's mine. So when they went to Dawood, Dawood, he judged for the elder sister to have the baby. Then when they went to Sulaiman, Sulaiman he said, okay, my judgment is to cut him in half. So he brought the knife. And the younger one, she said, I don't want him. Let the elder take it. So straight away he said, than it is for the younger. Why? Because she sacrificed her uh, portion of the child for the sake of saving the life of the child. So she, she said, let the elder take it. So that means it belongs to the younger. So the judgment, as I said, legalized in the book. And in the sunnah? Amr ibn al-As narrated that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, if a judge or ruler decided a case and strove to determine the correct ruling, then if, he, then if he were correct, he receives two rewards. And if he strove and was incorrect, he receives just one reward. The Muslims have all agreed concerning the sanctioning of, the, of judicial proceedings. Okay, so we've got now a also proof in Sunnah. We have plenty of hadith regarding this. We're going to come, inshallah, to one of some of them. And also the consensus of the companions to the legality of the judicial proceedings. I'm uh, just going to ask Ahmed, is... Uh, the internet, okay. My voice is heard. It's okay, Sheikh. No, it's not the best. It's ruling. Judicial proceedings are a communal obligation. The ruling, given the ability to do so, must be to judge between the people. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam judged between the people, and he sent Ali as a judge to Yemen. The rightly guided Khulafa judged between the people, and also appointed judges in the different lands. Right, so the rule for that is called fardu kifaya, a communal obligation. So it is 
if we have a, a, a province or an area or a city or a country, then we have to have a judge in order to refer to him. So, for example, in the Muslim countries, we do have judge, judges who have been employed by the state. The non-Muslim countries where we have now no Muslim leaders, I don't think the leaders of the non-Muslim land would appoint Muslim judges, we do have to have as well you know, people who can arbitrate, people who can settle disputes. So we do have, for example, the Sharia Council. Sharia Council, where the wife she refers her matter to the Sharia Council if she wants khulu, if she wants divorce, if she wants to settle a dispute with her husband and vice versa. So we, we have to have a judicial proceedings. Yeah, I know, but it's, the problem is YouTube. I, I tried and uh, I couldn't do it. It's not really taken. I don't know why. I tried it. Can you see me? So I'm just doing like this and I'm saying, go ahead, go live. It's just, it's not going live. So I don't know. Ah, go on. Starting, starting. Yes, alhamdulillah. Right. I've recorded it anyway, so going live now. Fine. Now we come to the here. The Prophet he sent Ali ibn Abi Talib as a, a judge for Yemen. And remember, Yemen is a place where people started to base Islam. There were Christians. Yemen had passed through history being Jewish and Christian, then the Muslims. Now we're coming to the virtues of being a judge. It's merits. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no jealousy except with respect to two people, a man whom Allah has given wealth and he uses it, and he uses it up for the sake of the truth, and a man whom Allah has given wisdom and he, and he decides by it and acts accordingly. Right, so there's two types of wealth here, the property and money wealth. The person was righteous using this property and the wealth in the right channels. So he is doing halal things. He is building something that to please Allah Azza wa Jal. So he's not squandering it like the person who is rebellious. And the second one has got a different wealth, which is the wealth of wisdom. And this wealth of wisdom, he is using it to judge between the people and also to teach others. These are the two things where the Prophet of Allah, he said, if you had wished for you, to have something like that person is not considered to be what? Envy. There's no envy. It's like as well, there's no envy in memorization or petition of the Quran. So if you wish to be like him as a reciter, okay, you wish to be a person like him into uh, his righteousness, there's no envy here. You want to be competing. Like the envy is that to wish that whatever blessing that Allah given to a certain person to be removed. That's the, the most wicked of evilness, is to just to be removed, regardless whether it goes back to you or not. As long as this person is to be deprived from the blessings of Allah, that's the most wicked evil. Right? Let's go now to the warning against such a position. It's perils. Abu Hurairah narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever has been appointed a judge has truly been slaughtered without a knife. So a judge is not just an honorable or honoring the person. It is actually to burden the person. It's a burden. We call it taklifun la tashrif. So who is being given the position of a judge is like he is being slaughtered by a different knife. The ghayri sikki. So you should not be a person who is keen to be a judge. But if you are a person whom you think that there is no one except for you, and no one can do what you are able to do, then, and there's nobody to cover for you, then you have to be the person responsible. Normally, it is the case that judges to be appointed, not the person who puts himself as the candidate, and then people to vote for him. So it is a person, it's like the imara, imara, which is the khilafah. Khilafah is judgment as well, the leadership. The leadership is not supposed to be a sought for, and you go put yourself as a candidate, no. People will come and they say, take the khilafah, take the imara, because we think that you are the best, you are the one who is fit. By Abu Buraida. Abu Buraida reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, judges are of three categories, one in paradise and two in hellfire. As for the one in paradise, it is a man who recognizes the truth and judges in accordance with it, 
As for the man who recognizes the truth, but is unjust in his ruling, he is in the hellfire. And the man who judges among the people with ignorance, he is also in the hellfire. So the judges are three types. Two in hell and one in paradise. The one in paradise, the one who's got knowledge, and he uses this knowledge to judge. Now, whether he hits the correct or the wrong, it is beside the matter. Do you understand that? Because he judged with his knowledge, and he judged according to what he think it is balance and fair and fairness. Yet he had a right to wrong conclusion. Because the person who had said that this is due right to me, and it wasn't, he was more eloquent speaker than the other one, so he judged in his favor, but he had judged in fairness and balance. So as long as he has got the knowledge and he judged in fairness and balance, then he's in general. Well, but the other two types which are in hell, the one who judged with ignorance, okay, judged with ignorance, then he is in hell. Whether he gets the correct Verdict or not, beside the point. So even if this person had arrived to the right verdict and he judged and his judgment was correct, but because he judged with ignorance, this is not called gambling. So he's in hell, that category. Third one is the one, no, he's got maybe the knowledge or he hasn't got the knowledge, but actually he had given the verdict with tyranny and oppression. So he was violent. He was not just whether he is an ignorant that makes him more hellfire, or he was a person who knows what the hack, but he favored this person because this person gives him money, because this person is from his race, this person is from his relatives, and so on and so forth. He is in hell. So if it is the case, mm, the percentage here is what 30% that you're going to be from the people of paradise. That's why it's dangerous. Now let's just see what is Islam. Does it encourage you to? Request to be a judge or not? No. The prohibition of seeking a judgeship. Abdul Rahman ibn Samurah said, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to me, O oh, Abdul Rahman ibn Samurah, do not, ask for, do not ask for the position of authority. If you are given it due to, your, due to your request, you will be entrusted with it on your own. If you are given it without asking for it, you will be helped in it. Right. Just before I continue, Ahmed, the, the the sound of both of us is it the same, or one of us is stronger, or one the both of us are weak. Please. Could you just tell me? I think they're both the same. Next to the same, alhamdulillah. Because before he was just taking my voice, not the one next to me. And I think it's just to do with the person who recites for me in Maidenhead. He's very, very low. Fine. So here he says here that do not ask for Imara. Imara in leadership. Do not ask for it. Because see if you have been given this Imara. Because you have asked for it, then Allah will put you for it. Go, sort yourself. But if you have been given the imara without you requesting it, then Allah will help you. People will help you. Allah will submit people to help you. But if you've asked for it, you are the one seeking for it, then Allah will put your trust into it and it will be no help, no barakah. So let this to be given to you by others, not to ask for it. And then Allah will help you with it. طيب. Now, we're going to talk about the following title. متى يستوجب الرجل القضاء? When? When is the role of judge? When is the role of a judge demanded upon a person? So what, when it is uh, incumbent upon us to seek judgment. Now. Ibn Hajar wrote in Fetih al-Bari on volume 13, page 100 and, uh, 146. Abu Ali al-Karabisi, the companion of a Shafi'i, wrote in his book, Kitab Adab al Qaba. Al Qaba. Al Qaba. I do not know of any. Kitab Adab al Qaba, the etiquette of judgment. I do not know of any difference of opinion among the previous scholars that the one who has the most right to judge between the Muslims is the one whose virtues, honesty, knowledge, and piety are established. A reader of the Book of Allah and knowledgeable of most of its rulings, knowledgeable of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and memorizing most of it having similar knowledge of the statements of the companions, knowledgeable of where there is agreement and disagreement, and knowledgeable of the statements of the jurists among the followers, able to distinguish what is, authentic, what is authentic from what is defective, follower of, uh, follower of in the new issues, the Book of Allah. If he finds no solution there, then the Sunnah. 
If not there, then he acts in accord with what the leading companions acted upon. He often goes over points with the people of knowledge and consults with them with politeness and piety. He guards his tongue, stomach, and private parts from, from what is forbidden. He understands the words of the claimants. Finally, he must be in, intelligent and staying away from following desires. Although we know that no one on the face of the earth combines together all of these attributes, it is still a must that the people of every place seek the one who is most complete and virtuous. It's impossible to find somebody with all these characteristics uh, and, and sifat. No way. It's, it's impossible. But we find the best of them. Nobody's going to be knowledgeable in all the Quran and all the Sunnah and all the sayings of the companions and all the difference among the, judge, the, the judges and the sorry, the difference among the uh, the apokaha, the jurists, and the, and also knowing how to make it this is authentic and it's unauthentic is definitely very hard. But we'll get the best. Like now we can uh, say with uh, consensus the following fact, and that is women are not to be judges. Abu Bakr said, On the day of the battle of the Demel, Allah benefited me by words that I had heard. When it reached the Prophet وسلم, that the Persians had crowned the daughter of Kisra, their ruler, he said, A people will not prosper if they are ruled by a woman. Well, the battle of the Jamal that took place between Ali ibn Abi Talib on one side and Talha and Zubayr and Aisha on one side. Both of them, they were not really aiming for a fight, but the fight took place because there were some people on both sides who wanted to initiate this fight. And they wanted to make sure that they would get away with their crime. So that's why the fight started and, and unleashed between, as I said, Ali ibn Abi Talib in one camp and Aisha and the others in one camp. And you see the companions, some of them, they were with Ali, some of them, they were with Aisha, and some of them, they, they, they isolated themselves from the whole thing. Now, of course, the haq was with Ali ibn Abi Talib, but the issue here is that the whole thing started when the companion as Zubair and Talha came to Aisha, the mother of the believers, the master, to go not to where, the, where Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Khilafah, she was not revolting against Ali. She wanted to make the Muslims to get together. So they asked her to lead, to lead the delegates to go there. And they convinced her so much. Abdullah ibn Umar didn't want to lead, didn't want to intervene. And he told her later on, you know, I didn't intervene. She said, you should have told me off not to go. That I can't because there is elder companions than me, Zubayr and Talha, all the companions, they are as old as his father. I couldn't do anything. So when the people had left with Aisha and left as well with Talha and Zubayr, and all, not only that, Ali uh, Ammar ibn Yasser came all the way from Medina to uh, Kufa to there. And he ascended the pulpit and he put Al Hassan, sorry, Al Hussein, Al Hassan and Ali at the end of the pulpit, at the beginning of the pulpit, and went up. And he said, Allah is testing you. Are you going to follow the Haqq or are you going to follow Aisha? For verily, Aisha is the wife of the Prophet in this dunya. Is she going to be his wife where? In the Akhirah. So he had testified for her that she's in Jannah, but what she's doing is wrong. And that's why she kept crying after this incident. Aisha until she drenches and wets her veil. So when Abu Bakr embraced Islam at the Battle of Hunayn, Abu Bakr embraced Islam at the Battle of Hunayn. The Battle of Hunayn is very, very late battle. It came about at the end of the year eight after Hijrah. So it's only two years, uh, I could just say a year and a half before the death of the Prophet of Allah. Yet he had heard a hadith of the Prophet is that this hadith says that when the Persians had, after the death of their king, Kisr Khosros, had made the queen, let's say, the queen, his daughter, to be the leader, the Prophet said the following words, No way, people, regardless whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, whether they are Arabs or non-Arabs, they will never be triumphed and successful if they put their matter in the hands of a woman. That means they make the woman to lead. He had memorized this hadith, and he said, this hadith benefited me from involving myself with Aisha, not to follow Aisha, because Aisha is the leader. Even she is the most beloved person to the heart of the Prophet from the woman. But because 
Prophet Allah, he said, no one, no people, no generation will be successful if they made the women to be their khalifa, their leader, the one who will take their last verdict and, you know, and for, for that. And we say here, it's not to actually to lower the women, to say that you are not a person to be consulted. The Prophet of Allah, he consulted him salam, in the Hajj uh, and, uh, and all in the truce of al Hudaybi. Prophet of Allah, when he shaved his head, and the companions didn't want to shave their head because you could see the Kaaba, they want to go and continue. But they had made a, a truce between them and Quraysh to go back. So he went so sad into the house, and Umm Salam, she saw him. When, he, when she was told about this, she said, Messenger of Allah, don't pay attention to them. You go and call your Baba, shave your head, and slope your animal. As soon as he had heard of this, he said, a consultation. So he shaved, and called his Baba, shaved his head, and he slopped his animal. As soon as the companions saw this, they did the same and followed the Prophet so steps. So here the uh, thinking and the and the thoughts which was be brought and the consultation by Um Salam was very successful. Even the Prophet of Allah was in need of it. But here it is to do with that is the women to lead as a judge, to lead as a Khalifa, to lead. Okay, because she's going to be mixing with men, and the women she cannot be mixing freely with men. She cannot be able to ask the men about the things. That she will be shy of. She will be asking about those things which are to do with privacy and all of this. And the woman should not be exposed to this. Imagine the woman now, she's going to decide whether this person is a fornicator or not. Is she going to say, Did you huh, do this? Like the Prophet will ask that man, Did you? And he mentioned the word which is a rude word. Prophet Allah, he mentioned it because for the sake of that purpose, that person doesn't understand what is Mubasha. Maybe he doesn't understand what it's talking about. Because it's going to entail his death by stoning. So he said to him, Did you? And he said the word. I can't say this word now, but if I'm in a position to be a judge, I have to say it. Because maybe that person doesn't understand. He said, Did you hug her? Did you kiss her? No, 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 no. He still insisted. Zenate, fornicated. But he doesn't, maybe he doesn't understand the word fornication. So he said to him, Did you ask the word? So can the woman be as blunt as like this to ask? The person who is in being accused, did you, how could she? It's a woman. A woman, she's meant to be far away. She's going to be shy, not even to look at the face of the person. The man, the judge, has to look to see, they reflect, and they will judge based upon the reflections. Is it a lie or a lie? The woman, she can't do this. That's why we're not saying the woman, she is not to be consulted, but she cannot be put into such a position where leadership, judgment, and this hadith, by the way, is in Sahih al-Bukhari. You cannot really say that, oh, maybe it's not authentic. Okay. Sahih al-Bukhari, 100%. It is authentic. Uh, the one who smiled is from Bangladesh. Bangladesh is led by a woman. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> right. I'm not going to get into politics. We had Margaret Thatcher as well. You remember that by the I am woman, she's called. Anyway, I'm not saying that every time a woman she would lead, she will be a disaster. No, that's not correct. But she's not supposed to lead. That's an Islamic world, Islamic uh, terminologies. Non Islamic, you could do whatever you like. That's Islamic. Now, is there any difference among the scholars? Not the real scholars. The dodgy one, I'll always be a different one. Difference of opinions. A double double. A judge's etiquette. It is obligatory upon the judge to be just between the two disputants with respect to his look, his words, his seating arrangements, and his entering upon decision. Abu al Malih al Hudari said, Umar ibn al Khattab wrote to Abu Musa al Ash'ari saying, Judging is truly an unequivocal obligation and a followed practice. You must understand if the case comes to you as there is no benefit to speaking the truth if it is not implemented and be equal to the people with respect to your facing them, your seating and your justice. A noble person should not have hope in your wrongful behavior. Right. So, OK, that's the Qadi has to be a person who's just between the people dispute and also in the way that he acts, the way he speaks. He can't speak to one person harsh and the person soft. Okay, he has to be judged in the way that he looks at them, the way he makes them to sit, and the way that he, they enter, everything. So he has to be uh, bearing in mind all of that. 
So none of the people who disputed, oh, the judge is against me already. I could see him looking at me with a face. When he looks at the other guy, he looks with a smile. It's not supposed to be like this. And that is why he says that the weak should not be in despair from the justice of this judge. judge and the one who is noble and strong should not be taken advantage of his tyranny. Now, it is forbidden for a judge to accept bribes or gifts. Abdullah bin Amr narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the curse of Allah is upon the one who gives a bribe and the one who takes a bribe. Abu Humaid al-Sa'idi narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, gifts for the state employees is theft. Right. So we talked about the bribe in the section of the bribes under the, underneath the, this transaction, if you remember. And here, of course, the worst of the bribes was to, give, to be given to the judge. But if the judgment had taken place, okay, and if this person wanted to honor the judge for being just afterwards, and this is not to be the trend in the fashion, then no problem. But to give him where all the judgment is to take place, no. And to give him where the judge is always know that if he judges for that person, he will give him a gift, no. But if there was a relationship between him and that judge, and it's all the time before the judgment takes place, that he is a friend of the star and it's, you know, we're always swapping off gifts between each other, I would say to the judge that if that sort of relationship is going to affect your judgment, step down. Step down and don't be the judge because you're going to affect it by this relationship with this one of the sides or the two disputing now. <clears throat> it is forbidden to give a judgment while angered. Abdul Malik ibn Umar said that he heard Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakrah say, Abu Bakrah wrote to his son who was in Sijistan saying, you should, not, you should not judge between two people while you are angered, for I have heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, a judge should not decide between two people while he is angered. Right, angry will make the person not to think properly. That's why even a person, if he divorces his wife and he was in a state of anger that he doesn't know what he's talking, this divorce will not be taking place. Fine, let's go to the judgment of a leader that he will not to uh, change from the haq now. A ruling by a judge does not alter the truth whatsoever. Now, what does that mean? That means if a person who knows upon, uh, himself is upon Ba'i, also, and he's trying to take the due right of somebody in front of the judge, and he knows that he is not truthful. He knows that he's not supposed to take the judgment in his side, in his favor. But because of his eloquent speech, because maybe he had employed a very good solicitor, he had made the judge to be convinced that he is upon the right. This judgment of the judge does not make this zulm is to be haq. Do you understand that? So if he had judged for you that this laptop is yours, and it's not yours, and you're a liar, so his judgment in your favor, based upon your eloquent speech and based upon how you forwarded your case to him, that does not make the laptop halal for you. Still haram. Okay, that's what the title is about. Fadl. Whoever is given a judgment wherein he is given the right of his brother must not accept that judgment for the ruling of a judge does not make what is impermissible permissible or vice versa. Um Salama, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard a dispute outside the door to his apartment. He went out to the disputants and said, I am but a human being. You come to me with a dispute and one of you may be more convincing than the other. So I think he has spoken truthfully and, and I grant him the judgment due to that. But whoever is granted a judgment by taking the right of another Muslim, then that is actually a portion of the hellfire which he can take or he can leave. Right. So in the hadith again, please, Um Salama, the wife of the Prophet Sallam, she said, that, um, the, that the Prophet Sallam continue. Um Salama, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard a dispute outside the door to his apartment. He went out to the dispute. Okay, so we benefit up to here. That the dispute took place. There was a noise. So the Prophet of Allah, when he came out, he tolerated that noise. And he didn't say, why are you disputing next to my door? Don't you think that you are disturbing me? So he overlooked that. So this is good tolerance and, um, and pardoning as well. So he did not uh, basically reproach him for that. Then he said. He went out to the disputants and said, I am but a human being. You come to me with a dispute. Okay, so I'm, 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 
So I'm not here to Here the Prophet is stating that he does not know the right. He doesn't know the unseen. If he knew the right, he said, he would say to him, okay, okay, I'll judge between you uh, regardless. He did not. He does not know the right. Yet sometimes that he will be given by the Allah, the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, a verdict regarding something. But it is not the case all the time. So he said, but I don't know the right. I don't know the unseen. And also this is here he says, I am a human being. And then he says, you come to me with a dispute and one of you may be more convincing than the other. Okay. One of you will be more convincing than the other. Then the judge has to listen to what? To both of them. And to listen to this person, what he says, and to listen to that person. So he should make the judgment, okay, accordingly. And also we benefit from this, that the judgment of the judge does not change the halal and the haram that take your place. So if you've done haram, and the judgment is in your favor, it does not make it halal. Because he said, I judge according to what I hear. Then he says, one of you may be more convincing than the other. So I think he has spoken truthfully and I grant him the judgment due to that. But whoever is granted a judgment taking the right of another Muslim, then that is actually a portion of the hellfire which he can take or he can leave. Right, so the judgment of the judge does not change the reality of the case. Whether it's, you know, it's in favor or not against your favor, it does not change the halal to haram or haram to halal. And the judge, he would judge according to what appears to him. So if he is to be correct, then he will get two rewards. If he's wrong, he will get still one reward. Double reward is correct, one reward if he's wrong. And the person also in this hadith should say the haq regardless. Even this haq, truth is to be against himself or his parents. And this is how you will be able to give aid to your brother, even if it's a tyrant. How? You stop it from his tyranny. Okay, so you are to be good to your parents by even making a testimony against it if it is if they are wrong. Okay, and that is what the Prophet is saying. Now, let's say, for example, that the judge is knowing the haq is with the person who is making the claim. So, a person is making a claim, he knows it's upon haq because he had seen, you know, uh, uh, what happened, and he knows that this guy. He knows him and he's seen that and he knows the haq. It is not permissible to for him to judge according to what he knows. He has to judge according to what they present from the argumentation. Do you understand that? So if the judge, let's say, so this person, okay, uh, uh, who is the one who's claimed that this person, he had this laptop. So this laptop, he knows it and he knows being, there's a mark, a special mark on it. So he said, this laptop, which the other guy took, is mine. So you know, the judge knows this because he's, he knows him. And he sees this laptop with him all the time. So he knows this laptop. So it's knowledge. But when he presented his argument, he did not present enough proof to say that this is his laptop. Okay? And the other guy, he made an oath that this is mine. Okay? Now, the judge cannot rule according to what he knows. Because he knows 100% that this lab belong, laptop belongs to that person. He has to judge according to the facts. And the facts here that this guy needs to present his, you know, proofs. That this is mine, it's receipts, people, witnesses. There's no witnesses. Then the other guy can make it an oath. Wallahi, this is not his, it's mine. Now, if the judge want to be as a witness, he would step down. And will leave the case to another judge. Then he would present himself as a witness to that person whom he knows that this laptop is his. Do you understand? But he cannot be a judge and a witness at the same time. So he will step down from the case and he will give it to another judge and he will be giving his statement as a witness to the other judge that this laptop belongs to this guy who cannot bring proofs except for the judge himself. Okay, so always the judge has to judge according to what he hears. And that's why the Prophet of Allah said, I judge according to what you tell me. So if I judge something which is not supposed to be you, that is going to be for you, then I'm giving you a piece of hell. I'm giving you a piece of hell. Let you take it or leave it. Bye. Go ahead. The claims and the proofs. A da'awa are the claims that someone is seeking. Thus, Allah has said, وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ Therein you shall have all that you ask for, تَدَّعُونَ Meaning, all that you seek or request. 
As a legal term, it is the claim that someone makes for himself that he has the right over something in the possession or control of another. So it's a claim that you have possession or control of something which is in the hands of somebody else. Now, the mudda'i is the plaintiff or the one who is seeking his right. So the plaintiff is the right word for it, the plaintiff. The mudda'i is the plaintiff, yes. The one who's seeking his right. Now. It, if he were if he were to remain silent, the case would be dropped. So if you don't really ask for your laptop, if it's yours, there's no laptop to be you decide. You have to ask. The plaintiff is the one who's going to make a, a case. He's going to make a case. So if there's no case, there's no nothing to be asked. Are you sitting there? Something wrong? With that? Okay, here, come, come focus. Come here, focus. Is that a the mudda'a alayhi, the mudda'a alayhi. The mudda alayhi yeah. is the defendant from whom a right is being sought. Okay, so the mudda'a alayhi is the one that you make the case against. So what do you call him this in English? Defendant. The defender? Yeah. The defendant? The plaintiff? And there's a plaintiff, the mudda'a, mudda the one who is presenting his case. Defendant. Defendant. defendant, yeah, the defendant, okay. If he were if he were to remain silent, the case would be would not be dropped. So if he's to be silent, then it will not the case will not be dropped. That means you have to defend yourself. Okay, okay, you have to otherwise you're gonna be accused. Yeah, the case will be against you. Now the bayinat are the signs or evidence, such as witness and so on. The fundamental principles of such procedures. Uh, based on the hadith of Ibn Abbas, who narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, were people to be given according to their claims, men would claim the wealth and blood of the people. But the taking of an oath is upon the one against whom the claim is being made. And Amr ibn Shu'ayb narrated... You understand the hadith? Again, the hadith, the Prophet said. Were people to be given according to their claims, men would... If the would... people should be given to their claims, whatever claim they claim, then... Men would claim the wealth and the blood of the people. And they would say, oh, they, well, this wealth belongs to me. Where's your proof? They don't need these proof. There's no need for proof. There has to be a proof. Now. But the taking of an oath is upon the one against whom the claim is being made. So first, where is your proof? There's no proof that the guy has to make an oath. By Allah, he took my laptop. Where's your proof? No witnesses, nothing. Okay. Then if the other person okay, made an oath, then the laptop will his, be his. If he did not make an oath, then he will claim the laptop. He has to make an oath to exonerate himself. Now, Amr ibn Shu'ayb narrated from his father on the authority of his grandfather that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the burden of proof is upon the plaintiff and the taking of an oath is upon the one against whom the claim is being made. Why didn't you say the defendant? <laughs> Right, so okay, because maybe maybe it's better than us in English. Um, so now let's say, for example, you have the proof. Has the other person the right to, to make an oath? No. So if I said that this is my laptop, I made the claim, and you are the defendant, you got the laptop. If I brought my witnesses, you have no right to make an oath that this is not his, it's mine. <laughs> you have got a proof, okay? So only if there is no proof, then you have the right to what? Make an oath that this is. That you are not, uh, you are actually innocent. This is belong to you, and the other the plaintiff is, is lying, falsifying facts. Now, the sin of one who claims something that does not belong to him. Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar narrated that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam say, "Whoever claims something that does not belong to him, that does not belong to him, that, uh, yeah. that does not belong to him, is not from among us." And he shall take his own seat in the hellfire. You remember the hadith before he said, I'm just giving him a piece of fire. Let him take it or leave it. Right. Now, the sin of one who swears a false oath in order to take wealth that belongs to another. Abdullah ibn Masirud said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever makes an oath as a defendant, which is a false oath done to take the wealth of a Muslim, will meet Allah on the day of resurrection while he is angered with him. Also, Abu Umama al Harithi narrated that he heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, A person does not take the right of another Muslim via a false oath except that Allah will forbid for him paradise and obligate for him the hellfire. 
a man from the people asked, O Messenger of Allah, even if it was an insignificant thing, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, even if it were a toothstick from the Arak tree. Okay, the Arak, Arak. Arak tree. Okay, so here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, if a person made an oath in order to take the right of a Muslim, you remember the laptop case? I made a, lap, a claim against somebody. This is my laptop. I couldn't bring a proof. This guy made an oath in order to make this laptop is his, but he's not his. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said, Allah will make Jannah haram upon him. He's not allowed to enter Jannah. And he, in the hellfire, it will be his abode. He will be punished for that. A man said, Messenger of Allah, what about it if it's something, nothing, insignificant? He said, even if it is a siwak. Siwak is the toothbrush, the wooden stick. Siwak, even if it is siwak from Arak. Arak is the tree where the normal siwak is made of. The Arak is the tree, which is the best of trees where siwak is made of. But so be careful if you're trying to take the right of other people by your oath. And also the Prophet ﷺ, he said uh, in a hadith, which is he said, there is nothing more than I would like to obey Allah with, and it will have a very fast reward than joining the kinship. So joining the kinship, maintaining kinship, this is the Prophet Allah, he said that it is the best and ultimate of me obeying Allah. And it is the one going to get the quickest, uh, uh, the reward from Allah Azza wa Jalla. And then he said, and there's nothing quicker in receiving punishment than the transgression and severing your kinship and also the false oath. This false oath, he said, قال, uh, uh, it will make the land like desert, no rain, no crops, poor in resources. So this uh, oath, which is false, Billah, false is, is one of the false oaths is one of the major sins. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had said uh, uh, in the hadith, which we're gonna talk about it later on, and regarding the testimony, that it is the, one of the major sins. Shaharatul Zul, Shaharatul Zul, and also in one in one hadith, Prophet Allah said one day, Adalat Shaharatul Zul al billah. The false oath had actually equalized in terms of sin wise the making the shirk in Allah, because Allah Azza wa Jal He said, "Wajtanibu qawl al Zul, wajtanibu wajtanibu rijsan yaf, wajtanibu rijsan yal awtham." وَجِتَنِبُوا قَوْلَ الزُّورِ حُنَفَاءَ لِلَّهِ غَيْرَ مُشْرِكِينَ بِهِ Talk to Hajj. وَجِتَنِبُوا الرِّجْسَ مِنْ الْأَوْثَانِ Avoid the filth of worshipping idols and avoid saying the falsehood. Falsehood. شَارِتْ الزُّورِ Testimony. False testimony. So the falsehood and testimony is equal to the what? To make a shirk. Allah Azza wa Jal. حُنَفَاءَ لِلَّهِ حُنَفَاءَ means that is monotheistic tilted away from the shirk, emphasis as well, that you are not going to be associating with Allah. And that's what the Prophet said, Very now, the tells false testimony is equalized the shirk of Allah in terms of sin wise. But remember, of course, the false testimony will not take you outside the fold of Islam, whereas shirk does, if it's major. But by this, we come to the end of what we have planned to talk about and inshallah we'll leave you sometimes you have questions and the following title will be inshallah on the 30th of october and we're going to repeat 30th of october al ahad sunday and it will be after isha your isha comes at 6 30 so we'll start the class around about 6 45 inshallah and its following title is going to be the means by which a claim is affirmed and these are very interesting topics we're going to be talking about the claims and how to, as well, uh, to make sure that we have uh, uh, affirmed the claim by which, and we talk about the testimonies and what's the difference between the testimony of a man and the woman. Can the woman testify in fornication, for example? Can she be a testifier or a witness in a, a case of burglary? All of that will be discussed, inshallah, uh, uh, as I said, on the 30th of October, Al Ahad. 6.45. Do you have any questions, please? Go ahead, just like one last Now, Faisal.
Sheikh, the hadith that says we are permitted to lie or to exa exaggerate the truth in three circumstances, is it only restricted to these three situations or can we lie if it brings about another benefit, brings about a benefit in other situations? Like what? Um, I don't know, Sheikh. Um, <laughs> no, you don't know? Any... I don't know. What are these benefits that you mentioned in outside this hadith? Tell me. <laughs> it's rectifying al islah bayn al nas, rectifying, and also harb uh, the war, deception, and also the man to the wife to the husband, husband to the wife. Now, if you said to me, what about if, let's say, a brother who is uh, in, in my house and he, this person, uh, who is a tyrant leader, sent his soldiers, uh, his innocent brother, I'm hiding him, uh, the Abbasidis are here, am I allowed to lie? We said in general, number one, there is a big word. Big word, word that has what? Double meaning. And you're asking me a question with the brothers here, and please, and Faisal, please always ask a question, please, later to the class, because, you know, uh, we, we have to explain what we're talking about. Number two, is that this is considered part of the war because it's like war against the leaders who are current and trying to take the brothers. So this is deception. So in both cases can be, you know, under the umbrella of that hadith. But as I said, in fil ma'aridi uh, meaning using these words which has double meaning, there is a space for the Muslim to use. And I've used that time, the Imam's Ahmad's example, when somebody wanted one of his students, and his student doesn't want to leave the class. So he pointed to Imam Ahmad to say that I'm not here. This guy is persistent and he wants me and he's going to waste my time. So he asked Imam Ahmad, is Al Mirwazi there? So Imam Ahmad said, Imam Mirwazi is not there. How can he be there? No way. He was pointing to his palm. He's saying he's not there. That means he's in his palm. How can he be there anyway? So the guy left thinking he's not what in the class. So Imam Ahmad did not lie. But this is only when it is needed. Do you understand? It's when it's needed. And you cannot use it as well for children. Children doesn't understand what you're talking about. So if you said to your child, somebody knocked on the door, go and tell him, dad is not here. And point to your pocket. That means he's not in your pocket. Then you go to the door, and he will say to you, my dad told me that he's not here. Because <laughs> he can't lie. No. Father. Uh, no, nah, um, you mentioned that um, the judgment only based on, on the facts that presented or relevant. Yes. Um, so the judge makes a judgment. What if um, can the can the can the uh, judgment re re reopen later if more evidence is brought up? So year down the line, two years down the line. Can the judgment be overturned because of new evidences? Yes, of course. So if the judge had later on judge for for example this laptop is to be yours because based upon your oath and this guy later on managed to find something to back and support but it could be too late laptop is finished it's been thrown it's been broken he will be liable to bring it but whatever information is in his gun so yes he's, he's this is called um, uh, uh, you know uh, in, in in the courts here that uh, when you have first court and then after that you have what do you call it? An appeal. An appeal. And even there's an after the appeal is something else, you know, the high courts that would uh, you know reassess the judgment. And in Islam there is something like this. So if you thought that uh, there is new evidences and then the, the court would decide whether they're going to take the case again or not, because in the light of new evidence, especially if it is to do with what with death. Where is the proof for this? There was Ma'iz ibn Malik, who was an orphan, looked after, and then he got married. And he's a person who was not knowledgeable. And he had made a fornication with the wife of his neighbor. And he was married. So the penalty is death. So he came to the one who looked after them. So he said, I want to be purified. I want to repent. He said, well, you go to the Prophet of Allah and ask him. Maybe he will give you purification. So he went to the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah, fornicated. Uh, he doesn't know what is the penalty, but he knows it's haram. 
he doesn't need he doesn't need to be knowing the, the punishment in order to be punished by the way as long as he knows it's not allowed Tahirin. he sent him back second time said, are you crazy go back what's wrong with you go back third time they were Prophet Sallam asked, is he okay in his brain? Is something wrong? Fourth time, son, smelling him, is he drunk? This guy is saying, purify me, that means stone me to death. That's what he's saying. Stone me to death. So the fourth time, he started asking him, did you hug her? Did you kiss her? No, 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 more than that, more than that. Then he used that, as I said, that word which is blunt. He said, yes, I did this. He commanded for him to be stoned. When he saw the stoning, uh, being thrown at him, he started running. He said, my uh, people have deceived me. <laughs> deceived me and tell me what happened. He started running. And when he ran, companions ran behind him, throwing stones and potteries upon him. And one of the companions called Abdullah ibn Munais, he found him running away. He met him and he got a jawbone. He saw the people flogging. So he got the jawbone and he threw the jawbone. He didn't want to kill him. Well, he just threw him with it. Either to stop him or and then it got him in a fatal position. He died. You know, the Prophet of Allah, he said, I wish that you let him. I said, an appeal. I wish that you let him get another chance. Maybe he wants to change his statement. He's allowed to change his statement. Maybe he's got something. should have let him. Not to let him as in, we're going to overlook the punishment. No. Maybe because maybe it's an appeal. He, he got something that he misunderstood or something like this. Because the Prophet of Allah said, Remember we told you before? Push away the prescribed punishment, even with doubtful matters. It is that, that or don't implement it. Don't implement cutting off things, even with doubtful matters. Yeah, not 100%. You know? Like this person who's been brought, this woman she's been brought to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And, you know, there's no confession except for hers. And the court, and she, 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 he was asking her, Are you a thief? And he says, Say no. <laughs> say no say, say, say no don't confess because these people are pushing you to confess say no so push the any prescribed punishment with what with doubtful matters even the doubt you remember when Abu Bakr came regarding a person accusing him that he had fornicated he said either you give me proof or gonna be lashing you and she lashes for defamation he said, by Allah, one well, lie is fornicated. And he brought one, two, three, and three. This is the fourth one. All of the three, he said, we've seen the thing in the thing. Actually. The fourth one, huh? And I'm like, what? Well, did you see it? Because if he said yes, he has to stone that person. So when he said, well, I haven't seen it. I've seen something bad. Man, maybe hugging, kissing. He said, Allah Akbar. <laughs> Lash them. <laughs> he was happy to lash them, not to kill that person. Lash them. Abu Bakr, he knows that this is happening. Says, By Allah, wallah, he did it after he's been lashed. So, lash him again, he lashes. I didn't know he said, nah, hang on a second. Leader of the believers, if you are going to lash him again, you have to stone that person of yours. Because it become what? Four testimonies. If you lash him, it becomes four testimonies. Second testimony, the, the second testimony of his now. So he let him go. By this, we're going to stop for the Adhan, inshallah. Fadl. You could make the Adhan before the prayer, no problem, inshallah. Sometimes it doesn't have to be on time, exactly. Now. Fadl. Yeah, let the person who knows the Adhan properly make the Adhan, ikhwani. Allah, Allah, Allah,
Yeah, the person when he is known to be a liar, it doesn't mean he lies in every second, in every moment. So if he made them a lie, we could just remind uh, an oath, remind him of the severity of his oath if he makes a lie and consequences in the day of resurrection. But we cannot just say because he's known to be lying in so many cases that he's going to be a liar in this case to say this is mine or not mine, whatever. Okay. Um, now, we're going to hear as well later on tes testimony of the disbelievers. Are they accepted to witness as a disbeliever? If it's against a disbeliever or against a Muslim himself, is it accepted or not? This is a you know very interesting topic as well. Uh, yesterday received two questions from the sisters if you'll allow it then they're asking okay i've got uh, three minutes go ahead um she wants to know Sheikh, what is the ruling on what do you do with a fetus if you have a miscarriage and and that fetus was one and a half months what do you do with a fetus which is one and a half months definitely you have to shroud that meat coming up. Maybe it's a human being, maybe it's not. But normally after 80 days, that's about two months and 20 days, almost three months, you'll find some sort of figuration on it, eyes and all of that. But before that, it's a lump of meat. You need to wrap it, put it in a box and bury it. There's no, you know, this, this is the, the thing that you could do upon this. So you could bury it. Now, in the prayer on the Sikh, the Prophet وسلم, he only made the prayer to be uh, uh, to be done on the fetus which has born alive, then died. So if it's born alive and died, then there is a prayer. Now, and this is a conversion amongst the scholars as well. Now. She's asking. During the khutbah of the Jumu'ah, is it allowed for her to make uh, notes? The person during the Jumu'ah, if he is inside the masjid, listening to the Jumu'ah, not behind the TV, then he's not allowed to hold anything except for uh, just focusing and do the khatib and listening and not to say a word. He cannot take notes. He cannot tamper with his mobile. That's including sisters as well. As I said in this, she's at home. You know, I need to take notes because she's not praying the Juma. Do you have any other question? One Is there enough time for me to ask you about the uh, if the wudu, if the is in and the madmada and the wudu and the ghasal also is um, obligatory, Sheikh? If we could shed some light on that. No, and there's no time for that because they're going to be telling now the Adhan, as the Iqamah, Jazakallah. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdul